Hi, thank you for watching Dig Into China. I'm Dong Shang. I'll continue to talk about China's huge and widening gap between reality and how the Chinese dictatorship presents reality. One major area where regime propaganda obscures reality is China's fight against COVID-19. Xi Jinping declared victory over the pandemic at a Beijing awards ceremony on September 8 last year. This was premature and new outbreaks have since occurred. While the numbers of new infections have been low by international standards, this has brought forth several large-scale lockdowns. In Hebei province, which neighbors Beijing, more than 22 million people were ordered to remain inside their homes for more than a week in January. This was actually twice as large as the Wuhan lockdown of 2020. Similar lockdowns involving tens of millions of people have occurred in Xinjiang, Jilin, and Heilongjiang. There is a friction between Beijing and the regional governments, some of which it believes have been too eager to impose lockdowns. This too is a feature of the intra-CCP power struggle. Currently, the regime's vaccine rollout is beset by problems. While China has gained some ground with its global vaccine diplomacy, exporting to 80 mostly low- and middle-income countries that have been cold-shouldered by the Western powers and their vaccine companies. Its domestic vaccine program is going badly. China has shipped more vaccines abroad than it has administered to its own people. 46 million is against 40.5 million, according to an analysis by the South China Morning Post on February 15. Not only does China face the challenge of vaccination a population four times greater than that of the U.S., it is encountering widespread public distrust. This is because of numerous scandals involving unsafe, expired, and contaminated vaccines, drugs, and food products over the past decades. Lack of transparency and the refusal of China's vaccine makers to disclose some trial data has deepened misgivings among the public. A survey in Shanghai showed that half the population did not plan to get vaccinated. Among medical workers in Zhejiang province, only 28% wanted the vaccine, according to another survey. The Chinese vaccines, which so far have only been approved for people under 60 years of age, have not performed well in comparisons with Western alternatives. Sinovac's vaccine achieved an efficacy rate of just 50.4% in trials in Brazil and 65.3% in Indonesia. This compares to an efficacy rate of 95% for Pfizer's vaccine and 94.1% for Madonna's. The Financial Times reported production delays at Sinovac's factories in China and a shortage of imported glass vials needed to store the vaccines. Skepticism towards the Chinese vaccine has also knocked some of the shine of its global diplomatic offensive. In December, Cambodia's dictator Hun Sun, normally a slavish CCP supporter, refused to accept the Chinese vaccines unless they were given WHO approval. Cambodia is not a dustbin, he said. Although the WHO is still evaluating China's vaccines, the Cambodian government took delivery of its first batch in January. But Han, who is 68, had to forego his own vaccination on the advice of Chinese officials. The safety and efficacy of the vaccine for people over 60 years old are still being studied, he said. In the Philippines, where another authoritarian ruler, Rod Rodrigo Duterte, is promoting China's vaccines, less than 20% of those questioned in a poll expressed confidence in them. Hungary is the only EU country to use the Chinese vaccines, and this is of course connected to the anti-EU grandstanding of the right-wing Orban government. But a survey in February showed only 27% of Hungarians are willing to take the Chinese shots. Although among supporters of the ruling party, this rose to 45%. 
Despite its bravado and concern that nothing should be allowed to spoil the party as the CCP celebrates its centenary, Xi's regime will face a number of reality checks. The debt crisis, the continuing Cold War with the US, and the fears that faster vaccine rollouts in several Western countries could tilt the scale against China. These challenges point to a turbulent period ahead. On the economic front, China has experienced a K-shaped recovery. Those earning more than 300,000 yuan, barely 5% of the population, saw their wealth increase in 2020, according to the China Household Finance Survey. But at least two-thirds of the population saw their incomes fall in real terms. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, real disposal income increased just 0.6% in the first three quarters of 2020 over the year before. This compares to a 6% increase in 2019. Household debt levels, after quadrupling in the past five years, increased to 62% of GDP in 2020. This compares to 76% in the U.S. Here, the rate of catch-up is astonishing. In 2008, China's household debt-to-GDP ratio was 18% compared to 99% in the U.S. More than anything, this is down to the bubble in the Chinese property market, which is among the most expensive in the world. Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Beijing have the fourth, fifth, and the sixth most expensive housing in the world, according to China Daily. Hong Kong is first. For the first time since 2009, not a single province increased the minimum wage last year. All the indications are that this wage freeze will be extended in 2021. This explains why per capita consumption after adjusting for inflation dropped 4% in 2020, the first such fall since 1969. The only sector to buck the trend was the luxury goods market, which grew by nearly 50% last year. Therefore, the GDP growth achieved in 2020 was not based on stronger consumption, which is the core objective of Xi's dual circulation strategy, but rather on the very factors this so-called strategy was devised to avoid – high debt levels, greater export dependencies, and a housing bubble. More worrying is the jump in already severe debt levels, which China's combined public sector, corporate, and household debt reaching 280% of GDP in 2020, up from 255% of GDP in 2019, according to the People's Bank of China. This rises to about 295% of GDP when foreign debt is included. It follows that China's modest 2.3% growth was achieved by its biggest ever increase in debt. This is not sustainable. The strains in China's bond market with a string of defaults by some big state-owned enterprises points to the first serious cracks in the financial system. For the super-rich, however, most of whom are CCP members and are integrated into the power structure of the CCP state, 2020 saw the fastest growth ever, according to the Shanghai-based Huren List. China minted 257 new billionaires during the course of the year, a rate of five new billionaires every week. Their combined wealth rose by 60% to 4 trillion US dollars. China pulls away from the USA, Huren reported. With 1,058 billionaires to America's 696, the CCP's 100th anniversary will see Xi's regime performing political contortions to obscure the reality that the class character and the politics of the 1920s communists were the polar opposite of today's authoritarian capitalist oligarchy. The growing political radicalization of Chinese youth, and most notably the explosive growth of pan-leftism and particularly Maoism, is a troublesome, potentially ruinous development for the CCP. 
Many young Maoists in China support internationalism, feminism, LGBTQ and ethnic minority rights. These youth are deeply critical of and even oppose outright the CCP regime as a capitalist regime. Just a few years ago, Alibaba founder Jack Ma was revered as Father Ma. Now he is called a vampire and a blood-sucking capitalist. Anger over the gaping rich-poor divide and especially the miserable treatment of 290 million migrant workers from China's poorer inland province is a major drive of today's political radicalization. The celebrations of Xi Jinping's complete victory in eradicating poverty are an attempt to shift attention from these realities. Not only has the regime proclaimed this miracle on earth, it has even deleted the word poverty from the official name of the anti-poverty agency, raising the possibility that all references to poverty will be prohibited in future. Chen Hongtao, one of the editors of Maoist website Red China, was arrested in February for posting an article exposing the fraudulent nature of the poverty eradication campaign. The government allocated 1.6 trillion yuan to poverty relief, which was used for investments in roads and infrastructure in some extremely poor regions, and the relocation of 10 million people. That was one side of the story. The other is widespread forgery of data, coercion, and faking of achievements by local governments to meet their anti-poverty targets. The campaign used a very low base to define extreme poverty set at $2.30 per person per day. This is lower than the $3.20 per day poverty line the World Bank applies to India and is less than half the level it recommends for an upper middle income country like China. Xi's campaign was launched in 2013 with the express aim of lifting the remaining 100 million people out of extreme poverty by the end of 2020. Given that his personal prestige was invested in this enterprise, there was no possibility this deadline would be missed. Reality, once again, is rewritten in the service of the dictatorship. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment and subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button right here. I'll see you again shortly.